Let me introduce uh, Matt Rugan to you. Matt and I know each other for about five years. I first uh, learned about his work through the papers, and then I met him a number of times at different conferences. He was working at AT&T back then. And I was always amazed uh, how Matt is finding uh, all different applications of mathematics to networking that uh, people before could not even imagine. Yeah. And uh, right now, Matt moved to his uh, home city and his home school and works for University of Adelaide. But I hope he will be coming um, more frequently to us so we can perhaps find some common topic for collaboration. And uh, in the anticipation of that, I invited him to give this talk about his current work today, which is published. This uh, talk will be on Google Video, so you can uh, download it later. And uh, Matt kindly agreed to give it to a general public for our Google Video database. OK, afternoon. Thanks for having me here. Uh, apologies if I seem a bit vague. I just got off a 24-hour plane flight a couple of hours ago. so. Uh, probably will go home and sleep after this. Um, I'm going to talk about privacy preserving data mining, in particular its application to network measurements. Privacy preserving data mining has been around for a couple of years now, so uh, it's not the algorithms that I'm going to be presenting that are new, it's primarily the application. As Andre said, uh, I've been working, I come from a math background, but I've been working with companies like AT&T for a number of years now, and we've really been doing internet measurements, trying to get things out of the internet, find out things about what's going on, primarily from a carrier point of view, to be honest. So perhaps some of the things I'm going to be saying aren't particularly targeted towards the sort of things that Google does, uh, more towards sort of understanding carrier performance, carrier track. But hopefully some of the ideas will be sort of in common. So one of the things that's uh, something that I've come to believe very strongly is data is really the key to understanding how networks work. Uh, you know, back when I was doing my PhD some number of years ago now, uh, we sat in little rooms and we wrote up equations on blackboards and we built models. We never really looked at a network and that was a really bad idea. These days, you start with data, you try and work out what the data is telling you and then you start building models trying to understand what's going on. You really need this data if you want to do any of the sorts of networking tasks that I've had to do. Uh, things like traffic engineering in particular, you need to have good data. The data tells you things that you didn't know before. Um, the other big change in perspective for me over the last few years is, uh, as Andre said, I left AT&T and I went back to work at a university. I left a lovely big data source. AT&T had wonderful internet measurement infrastructure, part of which I helped them build. And I went away and I don't have that data anymore. And this can be a bit frustrating, but it's not a situation that is unusual. Most people in universities don't have quite the access to data that people working for companies do. But one of the things that I've noticed is that even working for somewhere like AT&T, you end up with an AT&T-centric view of the universe. You get to see AT&T data. You don't get to see Sprint data. You don't get to see uh, you know, Unionet data. And this gives you a very sort of one-sided view of how networks are run, what sort of traffic they carry, what sort of characteristics those things have. So one of the things I've been thinking about is how you might get a more large scale view of the internet, what's happening on the internet, what its performance looks like, what its traffic looks like. The trouble is companies don't share. Um, why don't they share? Well, primarily because they don't want to reveal data. And there are a bunch of reasons for this. Some of them are extremely good. Some of the data is really private. I mean, you don't want to release data which would tell people what you know, various people have been browsing on the web. Uh, people have a, a fairly uh, large concern about maintaining their privacy, and you don't want to breach things like that. But honestly, part of the concern about uh, releasing data has nothing to do with privacy. Some of the data that I would be interested in is just the volume of traffic that's going across the network. Whose privacy is infringed by that? Companies still don't want to let that sort of information out. Part of the reason is they're worried that it will give their competitors an edge. Part of the reason, I think, sometimes is they're worried that the data will be misused. And this happens from time to time. I've seen a couple of cases of it where data was collected and released, and then someone came along, they took that data, and they did something with it 
that the data wasn't really capable of supporting. And then they wrote big advertising blurbs and the company that released the data said, oh, we're not going to do that again. Uh, so those sort of things have been a bit disappointing in terms of uh, releasing data. So the net effect is that no one out there really sees the whole internet. Um, the internet by its nature, of course, is distributed. Each company has its own perspective. You don't get to see that whole thing all at once. And that's kind of the sort of thing that I would like to be able to do, see the whole network. So let's look at a couple of really simple problems. Uh, how much traffic is there on the internet? Um, this is a question that I don't know how to get an answer for at the moment. There are a couple of papers which talk about it. There are a couple of people out there who quote numbers, but the numbers that I've seen, even the best ones, are incredibly rubbery. They're like you know, plus or minus 50%, even if you believe all of their assumptions. And I'm not sure that I do. Um, you know, back when it was the NSF net backbone, there were good measurements. Then suddenly it became this large number of companies and those companies don't share traffic measurements, so how do you find how much traffic there is? There's been the argument made in at least one paper that part of the origin of the tech wreck was the fact that the traffic measurements that people had were really bad. They got blown out of all proportion. People assumed that if the internet was going to double every you know, three months or whatever the hell it was they were saying, they assumed that if it was growing that fast, it didn't matter what your business model is, you could just you know, buy in at the ground floor and by the time it grew up, you'd be doing fine. Actually, the traffic probably was growing exponentially, but at nowhere near that rate. Um, there are a bunch of other problems, things like detecting distributed attacks on the network. It would be really nice to have multiple perspectives to help you do this. At the moment, most of the tools that are out there are based in universities, university networks. You know, they have a little bit of their university network looking out at the internet. Very few of these sort of large scale measurements involve carriers because the carriers won't cooperate in these sort of measurements by and large. There are always exceptions to these sort of things. So the, the classic example of this sort of thing outside of the internet measurement is the CDC uh, in America in particular uh, who effectively are charged with discovering new potential health threats. So the, the example that's getting a lot of press in Australia these days is bird flu. I don't know how much press it gets in, in the US, but it's considered a pretty big deal in Australia. We have a very large amount of our commerce that happens with Asia. And so there's a lot of concern about this. The data you need to track these sort of diseases comes from a whole bunch of different companies and government organizations and even non-government organizations like charities. Um, and the data mining community has been aware of this for a few years. And so they've been using a bunch of techniques uh, which originally came from an area called secure distributed computing, which is a real crypto area, a lot of really nice crypto math. And more recently, they've been, the community has been calling it privacy preserving data mining. So the goal here is to do data mining, the same sort of stuff we all think of when we think of data mining, but to be able to do it while preserving the privacy of the data. Now, there are, there are a whole bunch of ways you could do this, you know, one, one of which would be to be very rigorous about you know, how you treat that data, not use it in any way that you're not allowed to. But the strict sense of this privacy-preserving data mining, you never have the capability of seeing into that data, and yet you can do your data mining operations. So this is really neat. And to be honest, I'm a novice in this area. I come from an internet measurement background, and I found these techniques for solving a couple of problems that I'm really interested in. So I think there's some, some really cool stuff here. The obvious thing that you could do in this sort of context is to have a trusted third party who collects the data, does the data mining, and then conceals the data from any party that might you know, have nasty intentions. This works sometimes. Uh, I'd be lying if it didn't. In Australia in particular, so I'm from Australia, if you hadn't already picked it from the accent. In Australia in particular, the Australian Bureau of Stats collects information about ISPs, and they collect traffic statistics, broad level traffic statistics. So this is possible to do, but it's typically a really inflexible sort of approach to this sort of problem. It's inflexible because quite often it requires legislation. You need to legislate before these companies will participate in something like this. And the legislation has to be very specific, and as soon as you make it specific, suddenly you have no flexibility. Suddenly you have a new measurement you want to make, 
You can't go and make a new law every time you want to do that. So it's not a particularly uh, great approach, even in the cases where it works. And in, in North America, it hasn't worked as far as I understand. Europe have RIPE, who do a bunch of these sort of measurements. North America, Nanog and the equivalents just haven't ever managed to. I actually spent a few years working with people at Nanog trying to get them to do these sort of measurements, and it just never happened. So let me give you a couple of really simple problems that sort of illustrate the sort of things that you can do with privacy preserving data mining, and then I'll generalize them and tell you a bit more about some of the sorts of internet problems that I'm interested in. The dining cryptographer's problem is a kind of nice uh, problem. The, the idea is you have a bunch of cryptographers who are having dinner, and when they get to the end of the dinner, the waiter comes up and says, someone's already paid for your bill. And the cryptographers, they're a little uneasy about this because, you know, could have been one of them who paid for the bill, but maybe it was the NSA, or maybe it was someone even more shady than that who's paid for the bill. They don't want to be compromised by any sort of associations. So they try and work out who paid the bill, but they want to do it in such a way that they don't have to reveal, you know, the person who paid obviously wanted to be private about it. They want to be their own little deal. So they want to find out if one of them paid, but they don't want to reveal who it was. So it's a simple problem. Of course, they could just try and bribe the waiter, but we have a very good restaurant, and the waiter's not going to take any amount of bribes in this particular case. So that's one problem. Second problem, you have a couple of very rich people, and those very rich people uh, want to know who's the richest for some reason. I have a little arbitrary example there. You can make up whatever example you like. They're rather secretive, so they don't want to tell each other how much money they have. They just want to work out who's got the most money. This is a very simple problem. Um, we want to do this in a nice way. So there are a bunch of techniques for solving these sorts of problems. So I've labeled these as primitives, three simple operations that you can do in a privacy-preserving manner. And from what I've seen, you can do just about everything with these three simple operations. Although I'm sure there are some problems you can't solve this way. All the problems that I've been interested in or worried about, these three simple things you can do. So let's have a look at how you might do these, what they are, and uh, what you can do with it. So secure distributed summation is a really useful operation. The idea is you have n parties. Each of them has a value, bi, and they want to work out the sum. It's a really simple operation. You just want to do the sum of a bunch of numbers. The point is they want to keep their number private. They don't want anyone else to be able to learn what their number is. So here's the algorithm for doing that. It's kind of lots of words on that slide. I showed these slides to my postdoc before I came here, and he said there's far too many words on this slide. So I went and did a couple of little pictures of, of this just to make it a little bit more obvious what's going on. You label your you know, parties 1 to n. And I'm going to often call these ISPs because I'm really oriented towards ISPs. You label them 1 to n. <clears throat> the first one in the list uh, he makes up a random number r. And he's going to distribute this random number r from 0 to n, where we believe our sum is in the range 0 to n. Now, n can be a big number. It can be your largest integer, if you like. We just need to have some cap. So we're going to generate a random number, and then we're going to add it to our first value. So we end up with a number s1, which is v1 plus uh, our number r, and we do the arithmetic mod n. Now, the interesting thing about S1 is it's also going to be randomly distributed over the interval from 0 to n. So if I tell ISP2 my number S1, it doesn't give him any information. He can't infer anything about my value from that. He doesn't learn anything because the number he's got is just a random number from his point of view. So. The next step is you just go around the circle and you do the same thing at each step around the circle. So say we get to number four, he takes his value, he adds it to S, sorry, it's not quite the same thing. We don't keep adding random numbers in as we go around, we just keep adding our value on, we keep doing it mod n. The number that we pass on to our, our next person in the chain is still gonna be a random number from the point of view of that, that next person. 
and you go around the circle until you get to the end. And this is like one of those old math jokes. I remember these sort of math jokes you, you sort of used to have in, in high school where, you know, you have this chain of calculations. And then at the end of the chain of calculations, they say, and subtract the number you first thought. So that's what you do here. You take your chain of calculations, and then you subtract your random number. And the thing you get out at the end is the total. It's a really, really simple algorithm. It's, it's so simple. It's the sort of thing that you sort of kick yourself when you read this, and you think, well, I should have worked that out five minutes ago. It's really easy. It's really nice, though. It does have some issues, and I'll talk about those issues in a, in a second. You know, obvious issue is the only person who learns the value in this particular algorithm is ISP1. So he then has to share that with everyone else. And this requires a degree of honesty in the way this protocol is conducted. We'll talk about that in a, in a little while. Let's talk a bit about applications first. So the dining cryptographers is really easy to solve once you know this algorithm. You just make the value 0 or 1, and you make it 1 if one of the diners paid, 0 if he doesn't. Given that we're assuming only one person paid the bill, uh, the value is going to be 0 or 1. So n is 1. You just do your arithmetic mod uh, 2. And then you go around your circle, and that's it. You find out whether or not you, one of your uh, diners paid or whether someone external to the group of diners paid. The, the problem of calculating total traffic on the internet would also be trivial using this algorithm. Although there's some issues in terms of scaling it, because you might have 10,000 participants, you might not necessarily want to do it in a circle. You might want to come up with a more clever hierarchical scheme for doing this. But still, the basic idea is the same. You also have to be a little careful with internet traffic measurements. You don't end up double counting traffic. So you know, the way you'll probably end up doing this is by setting it so that you add up the traffic coming in from non-BGP customers, which probably doesn't mean that much to everyone here, but there are ways of setting it up so that it's not too hard to avoid double counting the traffic. Internet health statistics, likewise. You know, you can basically get a lot of ISPs these days make internal measurements of their performance. They send packets across their network, they measure the delays, they measure the packet losses in their network, and they use those measurements to help fine-tune the network, help improve it, help detect problems. But you could take those measurements and you could use this distributed sum to come up with network-wide health metrics. And you could do things like weight them by the traffic. You can see this secure distributed summation fairly easily generalizes to doing a weighted uh, sum or a weighted average for that matter. Um, you can do time series algorithms using this sort of technique. Uh, you can do the time series algorithms pre or post doing this summation as long as they're linear algorithms. But a very large class of the sort of anomaly detection algorithms that people are interested in in the internet are all linear. Uh, Nonlinear might make your life a little bit harder. Uh, one new thing that we came up with in particular was applying these to sketches. So how do sketches come into this? Well, you start thinking about this and it doesn't take too long to think of, you know, a hundred different data sets that you'd like to do this summation across. Uh, let alone when you start thinking about something like NetFlow measurements. Uh, NetFlow can generate really large amounts of traffic, really high dimensional traffic. There's a lot of information in there. Uh, performance data, you can get a lot of data about the structure of performance in networks. You could get a very, very high dimensional data set very, very quickly. Now, if you were then going to do these secure distributed summations over these high dimensional data sets, you'd be adding up a lot of traffic across the whole internet. It could get to be a fairly costly sort of operation in terms of your overheads. So that's something that I think a lot of ISPs would then balk at. That they'd say, oh, no, we can't do this. It's going to involve too much traffic, too much overhead. We're not going to do that. So what are sketches? Well, sketches are an approach for reducing the dimensionality of data sets effectively. Uh, typically, these days, they're applied to streaming data sets where the data is coming in in a stream. Uh, the analogy is your fire pipe, fire hose, where the water is coming through so quickly that you can't deal with it all at once, so you just do something on the fly. You don't try and store the data. You just process it and keep something representative of that data as it goes through. 
Um, there are a lot of papers on this now, and you know, the couple of references I have here is, is a pathetic subsample of all of the possible references you could give on sketches. I just want to give you a kind of very quick example of how this thing sort of works. Um, so this is, a, this is a sketch called the count min sketch. The idea is you have some sort of stream of updates. So your updates take the form AU, where A is a key and U is a value. And what you want to do is keep a big array, VA, uh, where the VA element tells you the total values of which have the, the, the key A. The assumption here is that N is going to be a large number. So the dimensionality of this data set is large, particularly large in comparison with the number of updates that you're receiving. So you might be talking about N being of the order, you know, a million or something, and the number of updates being more of the order of thousands. Uh, so you don't want to store necessarily this large vector. You certainly don't want to hand this vector around the whole internet as you do some sort of summation. So what does the sketch do? Well, you have this array, a D by W array. We're going to call it C. And you have a bunch of random hash functions, H1 to HD. These hash functions do have to be chosen a little bit carefully, but there's some good techniques for doing that. And what these hash functions do is they map your 1 to N possible keys into a much smaller space of, for better, one of a better term, I keep calling them keys. And the way they do that is you simply take your hash function, your series of hash functions from i equals 1 to d, and whenever you were going to, instead of incrementing this vector v up here, you increment this array for each of these hash functions. Then when you want to do a query, when you want to find out VA, what you do is you look for the minimum across I, across your series of hash functions of this array. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of, of why this is a good thing to do. It's not really my area of speciality. My co-author is the big one on sketches. Um, the point is that there are some really good techniques out there for reducing the dimensionality of data. The nice thing about this particular one is that it's all linear. So applying these secure distributed summations to sketches is actually, it's almost trivial. The thing you just have to recognize is that if you take the sketch of the union of all of these updates from a bunch of different places, I'm labeling the places by n and the update sequence by i, then that's equal to the sum over the sketches from each individual place. <coughs> so we can do a summation over these sketches once we've constructed them from each individual place. And we can use that. And, and this is a reasonably general property for a whole lot of these dimension reducing sort of techniques. Question? Yeah? Can you give some example of dimension? So one, tab, one kind of dimension can be metrics. So but metrics are usually like tens of metrics like your loss, delay. Or are you thinking of dimensions as a number of users? So uh, when I think in terms of uh, things, often I'm thinking traffic. And traffic, the dimensionality includes things like port numbers, what application people are using, uh, things like that. And that can get very large very quickly. Um, when you talk about performance, it's not quite so big, but as soon as you start trying to do performance from, say, city to city, you know, even in North America, there's a good 20 big cities that you want to have in some sort of matrix of performance. So 20 by 20 matrix is 400 places already. It's not even doing an international performance uh, set of performance metrics. So it's not that hard to come up with reasonably large sizes of data uh, just for, for performance. But, but traffic is where you start running into the really big uh, data sets. Uh, I guess when you're looking for particular sorts of attacks, you're looking for particular combinations of things like port numbers, uh, particular sets of IP addresses, particular prefixes. There's a whole range of these sort of combinations of um, groupings of traffic that could be responsible for some sort of anomalous behavior, some uh, misconfiguration or some sort of attack on the network. Does this make sense? Yeah, I mean, I guess you're talking about dimension in terms of, say, yeah, number of prefixes or number of ports, which can be hundreds, thousands, or something like well, that. Well, number of prefixes, you're talking about, uh, you know, getting on for 200,000 now. So that's that's one of the places it gets pretty big, yeah. Really? Number of ports is, you know, yeah. a couple of thousand that probably interest you. Have people have used this in 
practice through what do they, I mean, what's a good application where they use these sketches? So there's a paper, uh, yeah, the Internet Measurement Conference, uh, about three years ago, I guess, on using these for detecting anomalies in traffic. And so the basic idea was detecting things like denial of service attacks. And they were focused on detecting these within an ISP. And their dimension was what? I can't remember off the top of my head. It wasn't my paper. Um, just one I know of. But, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands, millions perhaps with traffic. It gets large very quickly. There have been a whole bunch of papers on how you can do various dimension reduction techniques on traffic. Sketches are not the only approach. I shouldn't try and convey that that's the only thing you can do. It's just a nice way of, of, of using these sort of techniques. <clears throat> so I've been a little bit uh, careless in what I've told you so far. Um, and that's kind of deliberate because, you know, I like to start out simple, but we have to do a little bit more. We have to consider what sort of security model we're actually operating under here. You know, when I talk about privacy preserving, what sort of privacy am I preserving? What do I expect from the participants? Um, the model that most people seem to use in this area is a thing that often gets called the honest but curious model. Uh, we should note that there's an intrinsic assumption of honesty in these sort of algorithms. Because you are never revealing your value, I'm never going to tell anyone my value VI, you can lie about it. There's nothing to stop someone from just putting in the wrong number, um, either through incompetence or deliberate malevolence. And that's very unfortunate, but it's an intrinsic part of this sort of privacy-preserving approach. You have to assume that the participants are going to participate in a way which is basically honest. Um, that's... that's I beg your pardon? So what would it catch for all <laughs> It wouldn't catch their accounting. Um, it probably would have done pretty well with their traffic. Um, you know, there are, there are a bunch of places where um, it, it's quite hard to force people to be competent. I, I'm more worried about competence of this sort of thing than I am necessarily about... Yeah. Um, Not just so I've heard different points of view. You, should, you guys should actually ask Vince Cerf what the story is. I mean, he works for you now, doesn't he? <laughs> he can tell you. Um, I've heard different stories about what was actually said, and I wasn't there. So you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, certainly, a lot of people um, believe things about traffic that weren't true. Um, whether or not it was Worldcom telling them, I can't really say. Um, let me get back on track. So you have this honesty issue. Uh, you have an honesty issue here. Um, but the idea is that we're going to allow people, even though they participate in an honest fashion, to be curious. So they're going to be allowed to perform extra operations to try and find out whatever they can. Typically, people uh, limit these extra operations to polynomial time algorithms. Uh, and primarily, that's because some of these uh, techniques that I'm talking about here are from the crypto literature. They assume things like RSA are going to be used, and if you have the ability to do non-polynomial time algorithms, very large algorithms, then you can break RSA and you can go away and you can do your factoring, and that will break some of these sort of techniques as well. Um, on the other hand, we do allow for things like collusion. And collusion in the simple algorithm I showed you for secured distributed summation so far is a really bad thing. Um, we can fix that, but let me show you first. This is a really simple example of how you do collusion here. Uh, if you have party J and party J plus 2, then party J, he made this number, so he knows it. And party J plus 2 hears this number from j plus 1, so he knows that number. And if I subtract those two, it's uh, trivial to extract vj, uh, which would mean that if you have two parties on either side of one guy, they can collude to find out that guy's value. Now, that's not something that we want to allow in these sort of algorithms. The plus side is there are a whole bunch of different ways of fixing this. 
So I have one really simple way here. I don't think this is actually the best way of doing it. Um, the best way is to use Shemi's polynomial secret shrink, the best way that I know at least. Um, but that would take me another 15 minutes to explain, so I've got this very simple way. I don't think this is necessarily a bad way, but I think the other one is a bit more elegant. The other way of doing it has a few extra properties. It also allows you to correct for errors. It has honest majority um, collusion protection, and so it's just a little bit stronger the protection you get. But this way is kind of nice. What you do is you take your value, you break it up into shares randomly, and then you do a secure distributed summation on each of these shares, but you do the summation in a different order. So you pick a random order for each of these summations and perhaps a random starting point, so no one particular node has a special role in the algorithm anymore, and you do this across these guys. And then right at the end, you do a normal sum across each of the sums you got from each of your shares. So what does this do? Well, it prevents, it obviously presents this sort of simple collusion that I've described. It prevents a whole lot of collusion attacks as well. Like I said, I think the polynomial uh, secret sharing technique has a little bit of an edge on it, but it will take me a little bit longer than I want to try and explain how it actually works. So, another application. So, into provider performance measurements. Uh, this is where it sort of gets interesting for me, particularly. I spent a number of years at AT&T trying to set up into provider performance measurements. And so I went to various providers other than AT&T and I talked with people there who were interested in measurements. And the technical people were very, you know, they were very keen on this because there are some good reasons for having into provider performance measurements. A lot of the problems in big carriers, at least, happen at the edge of the network. There are problems with inter-domain routing. BGP, I don't know if you guys know much about BGP, but BGP is a nightmare to configure correctly. Um, it's really, really not transparent. It's really arcane to configure correctly in most of the current routers you can go and buy. Really easy to make mistakes, and mistakes are made on a fairly regular basis. So a lot of the, the problems happen around the edge of networks. Add to that the fact that peering links are probably the most congested links in the big providers. The links that connect between these guys often have the, the worst performance, and it's really important to monitor these links. So the technical guys, when you go and talk to them about these sort of performance monitoring things, the inter-provider performance monitoring, they're really positive. They really want to do it. It goes up the ladder up to some sort of senior management person, and then they don't want to do it so much. Uh, they're, they're scared of the way the data is going to be used. And this is, like I said, this is because in some cases they've been burnt. These sort of data sets have been taken out of context and people have gone and done ratings of ISP. So they've gone, you know, this ISP is number one, this ISP is number two, this ISP is number three. That's not the point of these measurements at all. They're quite often not set up in a way that actually allows for valid comparisons to be made. They're not commensurate data sets, so the comparisons are not necessarily even valid comparisons. People get very upset when this happens and they tend to back away and they tend not to do it again. So this is one of these sort of things where it's, a, uh, it's an issue for people to get these sort of performance measurements. Again, it's not impossible in Europe. RIPE have set up a very nice measurement infrastructure and eventually we got AT&T to participate in Europe's uh, RIPE infrastructure. So there are some measurements, inter-provider measurements. But as far as I know, there's no really good uh, large-scale inter-provider measurements going on in North America, or in Australia for that matter. Um, various research organizations set up measurement infrastructure around the network. So Andre used to work for CADA. They do a huge number of really wide-scale measurements of the internet. The trouble with those is they tend to be focused on academic networks. They tend to be running across things like Abilene. They tend to be running across, in Australia, Arnet, the academic research network in Australia. That doesn't tell us much about the, the real consumer internet, unfortunately. And it's always a problem getting good measurements of the consumer backbone. Another thing that I want to emphasize is you want one-way delay measurements here. Um, people sometimes don't get this, but inter-ISP routing is fundamentally asymmetric. It's absolutely fundamentally asymmetric. I, I'm not going to go into details about this, but there is no part of it that isn't asymmetric. 
if, you know, you have to have one link connecting you to the rest of the internet to get symmetry. Um, that's the way it typically gets set up. So one-way delay measurements are really important. So how do you make these sort of measurements? Well, it's pretty easy in principle. Well, I shouldn't say easy in principle. A lot of people have done a lot of good work to make it easy for people like me to make these sort of measurements. I have a number of colleagues who spend a lot of time on doing things like setting up very careful GPS clocks for these boxes so that you have good clock synchronization and so on. But I'm not going to talk about that today. What you do is you just send packets. You have a box in each of these networks and you send probe packets. And you measure the, the performance of these. And these represent samples of the underlying performance of the network. So actually, this is a really nice, from a statistical point of view, this is a really nice sampling problem. Um, I'm not going to talk about the sampling problem either today. There's some interesting math you can do there. I want to stick to the one topic though today. So you set your problem up like this. You have K, I, J probe packets going from ISP I to J. Notice K, I, J, J is actually a random variable. One of the reasons for this, there's a good, good idea that people had back in internet measurements a number of years ago, which is Poisson probing. The idea is you send packets as a Poisson process. You don't send packets going bang, bang, bang. You send them sort of bang, 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 as this random sequence. The, the original idea for this was to avoid any chance that you might accidentally synchronize with some network phenomenon. So if you had your measurements and you were sending them at uniform sampling spaces, there's this potential that there would be some periodic behavior that you'd synchronize with. Now, how likely is that? I don't know. But in this particular context, Poisson sampling is really useful. The reason is that the Poisson process has this nice property that you can't anticipate it. You can't anticipate when the next probe is going to happen. And that's nice for this secure distributed uh, computing sort of problem, privacy preserving data mining, because if you send those packets at regular intervals, then the guy receiving them can kind of work out something about when they're being sent. He can set up a statistical inference problem to try and work out what the guy sending them is doing and work out the delays of the packets or the packet losses by just looking at what he receives. But if you send them as a Poisson sequence, he can't do that anymore because there's this lack of anticipation problem property that the Poisson process has. So that's one part of this, one part you have to get right. You also, you have to do a few things differently from the standard way people do these performance measurements. The typical way people do this is they put timestamps in the packet. So you send the packet with a timestamp in it, the timestamp tells you the transmit time up here, and then the receiver gets the receive time, takes the transmit time, the receive time, subtracts one from the other, and then he knows the delays. He knows when packets are lost because he looks at the sequence numbers. But we don't want to do that either because having sequence numbers would let us, again, set up this nice statistical inference problem where we could work out what's going on with these packets. So that would be bad. So we're going to send these packets, but the sender is going to record the transmit times, and he's not going to tell anyone else. And the receiver is going to get the receive times, and he's not going to tell anyone else these receive times. So that's part of the secrecy. Obviously, the delay is given by the difference between them. The average delay is just an average over all of these guys, all of these packets that are sent in our sequence. I have a couple of other averages there that I'm going to use in a second. So if, other, if, if you don't want your ISPs to be able to make comparisons with other ISPs, well, the first thing you're going to have to do is give up on some sorts of measurements. You're not going to be able to, you're not going to, be able to report this number. Because as soon as you report this number, some, some idiot is going to go out and he's going to put it on a web page and Google's going to index it and then someone else is going to come along and say, oh, look, you know, at and is at the top of that. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, someone else is going to look at it and say someone else is doing badly and they'll complain. They'll, you know, working at AT&T, we got complaints from people when they saw these lists. They'd say, why aren't you at the top of this list? Um, as I said, they're not always designed for this purpose. So let's limit it to looking at an average across these ISPs. Now, honestly, that does restrict the utility of these measurements. It, it, you lose something by doing it. But you're still better off than you were before you had the measurements. You still know a hell of a lot more than you did before that. You know, yep? So what exactly do you know? What exactly do you know? There's no time. So what do, what, do, what do you know? So 
The transmitter knows the transmit time. The receiver knows the receive time. That's all that they know at the moment. So we don't have any way of, of, of putting them together yet. We're going to do that in a second. And what we're going to try and work out is this average. This is the outgoing performance from our network the average outgoing performance to all of the other providers. Uh, we could work out the incoming performance, and it's, it's a trivial operation to, to do that once I show you how to do this one, but I didn't want to take up any more space on these slides. Uh, and we can't share these individual measurements, so we're not, gonna, we're gonna, not gonna allow them out of the box. So how do we do this? Well, I just rearrange my sums a little bit and write them like this. Uh, not a big deal there. Uh, let's think about it from the point of view of the transmitter. I is the one who wants to work out D out I. So he's the one who has to get this number at, at, at the end of the day. He already knows the transmit time, so he knows this thing, this T bar. He wants to find out R bar. That's just a sum. We can use secure distributed summation to work it out. So at this point, this looks trivial. Uh, this is all you have to do. Secure distributed summation over the receipt. This looks too easy. Why am I bothering to give you another example which is quite this easy? Well, it gets a little bit hairier when packets can be lost. Again, packet loss averages, the, the average loss percentage, we can work that out using a secure distributed summation. The problem is when we want to calculate something like delay. I should say, I'm, I'm calculating averages here. You can use the same techniques to calculate distributions or marginals or whatever you like. Um, I'm just focusing on averages to keep everything simple there. Um, but the problem is when we calculate D out, this average delay, we have to censor out the measurements where the packet wasn't received, where it was lost. Um, otherwise, we're going to really heavily bias our average delay measurements. We can't tell the other RSPs which packets were lost because that would be telling them you know, a huge amount about our performance. They'd then start comparing packet loss percentages, and that would be just as bad as comparing delays. So we can't tell them which packets are lost. We can't put sequence numbers in the packets. I've already said why we can't put sequence numbers in the packet. We get a, we get a statistical inference problem, and that's not... Great, so what do we do? Well, we're gonna use another secure distributed operation. This one is to do a dot product. So you, you guys would have all learned what a dot product is. It's just an inner product of two vectors. You have a question? Uh, who actually will learn that the packet is lost? The sender or receiver? Neither of them know it's lost yet. Okay, this is, this is the problem. Neither of them know it's lost because the sender knows he sent a packet. The receiver knows he did, didn't receive a packet. No one knows the packet's been lost. We'll, we'll fix that in a second. Let me, let me explain this first. I'm not gonna tell you how to do this one. I have, a, I have an extra slide if you're really interested, I can show you how to do it. But for the purpose of keep getting us through this talk in you know, nominally, well, maybe 50 minutes, um, I'm going to go through this, just what it does. So we want to calculate a dot product, which is just a sum, say, uh, Bob and Al Alice and Bob are our traditional cryptographers here, and they're the ones who want to do things like this. So Alice and Bob have values A and B, they're both vectors, they want to calculate this sum across the elements of those vectors. Now, we could come up with some kind of secure distributed algorithm here, one of the key things with these algorithms you've got to remember though is even if the algorithm is secure, the result is not necessarily, because you're gonna share the result. So what if I put B is equal to 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Then Bob is gonna learn AI. He's gonna learn one of those values. We don't wanna allow that. So we have to, we, we can't tell either of the, the, the two participants A dot B. That would be, the algorithm might be secure, but the result would tell us too much. Something you always have to be aware of in this sort of context. So what we do is we split the solution into VA and VB, and we tell Alice VA and we tell Bob VB. And you know, the first thing that I thought when I saw this, I was you know, reading through a pure math sort of crypto paper on how to do this. 
And I was thinking, why the hell would you want to do that? I mean, wasn't the point for them to learn the sum? So if you tell them part of it, you know, we deliberately choose these things in a way such that if you know VA, you can't work out VB. What good does VA do you? Well, this is a really nice example of, of the good that VA does you. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a packet ID in each packet. Importantly, these packet IDs are not sequence numbers. We're going to choose the packet IDs randomly from some set. We make that set large enough so that it's going to be larger than KIJ for all I and J. But, so we're going to make it a fairly big set generally. We're going to make it a lot larger perhaps. And then we're going to pick random packet IDs out of this set. And then we're going to create an indicator vector. And what the indicator vector does, or the indicator, so this is my I, IJK. It's one if packet with ID K from I to J is received. So the receiver creates this vector. The receiver knows this vector, to answer your question. He knows this vector. He doesn't know whether those packets were the ones that were sent, but he knows this vector. So the calculation now looks like this. It's a little bit different. MI is the total number of packets that we send in all of our measurement experiments going out of I. So uh, total number that are received, I should say. So the transmitter doesn't know MI. Transmitter doesn't know I, um, but he does know T. The receiver knows I, the receiver knows R. So the receiver can calculate this bit pretty easily, the I times R. This is the bit that we worry about, I times T. But if you look carefully, this is just a dot product. The receiver knows I, the transmitter knows T. So this is a dot product. Oh. So too many words on this slide. I, I, no. Completely too many words. The important bit though is we take our dot product and we break it into two bits. One bit's known to the transmitter, one bit's known to the receiver. The bit that the transmitter knows about, he can just take those values and he can add them up across all J. No problem there. The bit that the receiver knows, or the bits that the receiver knows, they can use a secure distributed summation to add up across all J. The MIs you can work out by doing, again, a secure distributed summation across all of the Js. And once you've done this, you put these numbers together, the transmitter then has all of the bits he needs to calculate his delay measurement, his delay metric. So this to me is, is it really, this was what really showed me why you needed this inner product and how it could be used. You don't use the inner product just as a direct result you use those outputs from it, you then sum them across some other set, and that then means that you can share the result of that sum because you don't learn any of the particular values. I was gonna tell you a bit about oblivious, who wants to learn a bit about oblivious transfer? Okay, well, here is, oblivious transfer is good. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna use oblivious transfer except that oblivious transfer is actually part of this inner product operation. So I'm not gonna give you a specific example of oblivious transfer in the context of internet measurements, but it's part of this inner product that I've shown you already, so I feel justified in, in telling you a bit about oblivious transfer. There are a bunch of different versions of oblivious transfer. The one I'm gonna talk about, I have some references here, it's called 1NN oblivious transfer. It's a very simple, conceptually, it's a very simple operation between two parties, Alice and Bob again. Alice has a list of numbers, A1 to AN, and Bob wants to know one of those numbers. But he doesn't want Alice to know which number. So Bob wants to know our, our, oh, sorry, a, B, a beta, but Alice mustn't learn beta, and equally, Alice doesn't want Bob to learn anything more than he gets, so Alice doesn't want him to learn anything except A beta. So you set the problem up, it's a very simple problem. The algorithm for um, solving it again, a little bit too complicated for me to go into detail except possibly if people have questions afterwards. Um, but it's a really neat little trick. And 
again, between this trick and the inner product and the secure distributed summation, there's not a hell of a lot I think you can't solve in this sort of context. So let me give you one example of how to use oblivious transfer. Uh, I showed you this millionaire's problem at the start. Let's solve the millionaire's problem using oblivious transfer. Actually, the millionaire's problem was originally proposed by Yao in, in a paper that goes back to, I think, 1982. So it's, you know, good 20 or so years old. And the technique he came up with there is very clever. I like this way of doing it a little bit more because it's more generic. It's, it's, it's no better than the one Yao came up with, but I can apply this technique to a whole bunch of problems, whereas Yao's technique was very specific to the millionaire's problem. Yao's original technique, I should say, Yao actually generalized his work as well. Um, so how do we do it? Well, we have, to, we have to put, again, a cap on our range of possible wealths. We can just make that, how much money is there in America? That, that's a pretty big number, that should be enough, a trillion dollars or something. No one has more money than that. And then Alice is gonna make a list from zero to N, and Alice is gonna make them all zeros until you get to Alice's wealth, and then after that, they're all gonna be ones. And Bob is just gonna do an oblivious transfer. Bob is gonna request WB, his wealth. So you can see immediately what happens. If Bob gets a zero, then Bob has less money than Alice, and he's gonna be very disappointed. If Bob gets a one, then Bob has at least as much money as Alice. Obviously, there are some issues here in the fact that we, we do have to do some discretization here when we're, we're, we're making this calculation. You know, they'll, they'll probably be happy if they've got the same amount of money, plus or minus $1,000, I would guess. Uh, you could do it, you could reverse it as well, and they could get rid of the, that nasty little equality case by reversing the, the, the process. Obviously, Bob has to tell Alice about this. This comes again back to the honest but curious model. Again, there are ways of making it a little bit more general, so you don't have to rely quite so much on that in this sort of problem. So there you go, there's a solution to the millionaire's problem. So we're getting kind of to the end of my talk, which is probably a good thing given the time. Future. Um, I think this is a really cool, like, like I said at the start, I, you know, this stuff is pretty new to me, and I think there's some really, really cool ideas here. Some really, really cool things you can do. Um, particularly, I like the implications for a whole bunch of problems that previously, at least in internet measurement modeling, internet control, from the point of view of ISPs at least, had been sort of considered as game theory problems along the lines of something like the prisoner's dilemma. Those of you who don't know, the prisoner's dilemma is you have two prisoners, uh, the, the, they've been involved in some crime, the police put them in two cells and they quiz them separately. If the two prisoners uh, both clam up, neither of them tells the police anything, the police don't really have any evidence, they'll have to let them go. But if one of them confesses, the other guy is gonna go to jail forever. And if both of them confess, then they'll probably go to jail, maybe not for quite so long. So it's really in their interest to cooperate. The problem is, the sort of people you end up in that sort of situation quite often aren't particularly trustworthy, and so they don't cooperate, they lie, one of them confesses, or possibly both of them confess, and they both end up in jail. This is the prisoner's dilemma. Should I trust my partner or not? Uh, there are a bunch of similar problems where you look at things like interdomain traffic engineering, where you have two ISPs. Traffic engineering is the process of balancing your traffic across a network. When you talk about interdomain traffic engineering, if I rebalance my traffic, that affects that other network. And likewise, if he rebalances his traffic, it affects my network. If you can come up with an algorithm that optimizes your joint performance, that's great. But how do you trust the other person to play fairly, to do this honestly? Well, there are a bunch of techniques you can use here that will allow you to make measurements, to make uh, tests of whether or not they're behaving correctly. Um, it's not a panacea, but perhaps if you can improve the trust between ISPs, there's a whole lot of these sorts of algorithms that suddenly become much, much more attractive to them. And this will, in the long run, reduce costs. It will improve performance and all the, the usual nice things. So, conclusion. We can do some stuff that I had never imagined was actually possible. And 
this is literally true. There are a bunch of these problems, inter-domain inter measurement problems, that I just didn't think you could actually solve. And it turns out you can. There's been uh, you know, half a dozen papers written by the internet measurement community on anonymizing traffic. The idea being that you have to take out you know, the headers of the, the, the traffic, you have to do something to IP addresses. All of these anonymization techniques have real headaches and most of them don't work as well as they need to to satisfy companies like AT&T. AT&T don't release anonymized traffic. It's, the anonymization techniques aren't good enough for them to trust. These techniques give you a guaranteed way of doing these sort of computations that is, is really, really neat. Uh, it's one of those sorts of things where um, I think it's just waiting to happen. So as I said, this is all new to me. I'm looking for people who are interested in participating or cooperating or doing some of this sort of stuff. Um, so talk to me afterwards if you uh, have some suggestions or talk to me now. Ask questions now. I think this is a good time to ask questions. Yep? Yep. 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 What's wrong with that? Um, uh, okay, there's nothing in principle wrong with it. I mean, it, it's great to have trusted third parties that you, you can work with. And as I said, in, in Europe, right, fulfill this role, they do a whole bunch of performance measurements. Um, the problems for me in trusted third parties are the fact that they're not always easy to find parties that will fulfill this role in any particular situation. And when you do, quite often, uh, the result is very inflexible. For instance, you know, one of the things that happens, say you want to share data with your customer and you want to do it through a trusted third party, this involves writing a couple of contracts. So you're writing a contract between two parties. Okay, how many lawyers is involved with that? Most of the contracts like that that I've ever been involved with took six months or something to do, at least. Um, as soon as you start including uh, N parties, the, the time to, to do those negotiations goes up as N squared. And this was one of the things that killed off the efforts we were trying to do within Nanog to set up these inter-provider performance metrics is that every person who came to the table had their own specific sets of requirements for what would happen with those measurements, how they would be made, what equipment needed to be used because that was their set of processes. And it just, it meant that you never got anywhere. Uh, you know, as fast as you, you made traction with one sort of thing, something else changed. And then you have the issue of, well, I've, I've spent my two years, I've set up my measurement infrastructure, great. Now someone, some researcher has come up with this brilliant new measurement that's going to change the way we, you know, do things on the internet. Am I going to spend another two years to set that up? Um, it would be really nice to be able to say, we have this bunch of primitives, go away, write your operation in terms of those primitives and we'll just run it. Turn it into a kind of API that people can use. So um, I, I don't have anything in principle against third parties and there's a lot that you can do with that approach, but I think this is better. Um, the people I've talked to so far are optimistic but they're not going along with it yet. So I think it requires uh, a pretty good job of selling it as well. And you know, this is something that I'm hoping to spend a little bit of time on in the next year or so, is trying to get a few people at least to participate in doing this sort of thing. Um, it will be interesting to see how well they respond. Um, I think uh, you need to cover a few things very well in terms of you know, making sure they believe the claims that you're making about privacy and, and so on. But these the sort of measurements are so useful to them that I think they will eventually come on, on board. That's, that's what I'm hoping, at least. So just a few speakers again for giving the brilliant talk right of this place.